right, time to get started. The exam will be over chapters 28 to 30. And so doing a quick review over the stuff that's gonna be on the test. From chapter 28, that's relativity. Relativity, what are the things that are really important to know? Well, understand those postulates of relativity. That is that the laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames. That's a postulate. It's not like a proven, you know, it's, it's a beginning point for relativity. And then the second one, the speed of light in vacuum is the same in all inertial reference frames. And from just those two ideas, all of the relativity stuff that we did is derived. Now there is more. We only did special relativity. General relativity, talking about how mass deforms the space-time continuum, and you can't distinguish between gravity and acceleration. You know, that's that's not something we studied. So everything just came out of those two things. So you should think about, you know, be able to understand ideas of like why Einstein posited that you have to have times passing at different rates and different reference frames. And then, of course, once you have times passing at different rates, you're going to have to have lengths changing as well. So you should be able to understand and you know, look at a situation, be able to apply those ideas about why we have to have this relativity. And then, of course, be able to apply the time dilation equation and the length contraction equation, which means you have to be able to identify what's the proper frame for time and what's the proper frame for distance. The two aren't the same, right? So proper frame for time is the reference point in which the events are occurring in the same location with respect to the clock. So basically the clock is at rest and the events are in the same place. Or, you know, that, That's how we measure the proper time. The proper distance is where the two points separate. And even if you don't have, you know, oftentimes we have holding a meter stick. Well, what if they're not holding a meter stick? What if it's, you know, just the distance between two plants? Just pretend it's a meter stick. And then the reference frame where that meter stick is not moving is the one that's going to measure the proper length. What direction does length contraction occur in? The direction parallel to motion. So if I have the meter stick traveling like this, it's still going to be one meter long. It's just the, the width changed. If it's traveling like this, what's going to happen? The height's going to stay the same but the distance out this way gets smaller, so it's like this now. So it'll be shorter and at a different angle. Okay, finally be able to work with relativistic momenta and energy. So, you know, you have relativistic momentum, gamma, m, v, So you have your relativistic equations. That gamma, you better be able to calculate. I, you're going to have the equation for gamma. But if you look at the gamma and you're scratching your head, you need to spend some more time just familiarizing yourself with these equations and how they work. Because the gamma needs to be something that's like second nature to you. <laughs> nice V. That's the calculation for gamma, the, the Lorentz factor. How do you determine if you need to use relativity? Okay, if it's better, if it's greater than about a tenth the speed of light. So if it's going faster than about 0.1c, then you need to use relativity. In terms of energy, I was reading. I spent at least five minutes trying to remember the word correspondence, which fortunately just came into my head 30 seconds ago. I couldn't think of it all that time. I gave up looking on the internet because when you can't remember what the word is you're looking for. Um, so um, now that I've said correspondence, hopefully it'll stay in my head. We have the correspondence principle says that the relativistic calculations need to be the same as the classical physics calculations in the area of overlap. So the area of overlap is when the speed's less than about the tenth of the speed of light. 
So since they're going to give you the same results, you don't use relativistic calculations in that range. Why? Yeah, because they're more complicated. Do the easy ones, right? Don't waste your time. But we did show that at low speed, wow, it's like writing is a skill I lost. At low speed, gamma is approximately equal to 1 plus 1 half V squared over C squared. And so you can go through and do your calculations, but, but why spend your time? Why not just go with easy? Um, a, a student, actually two students have asked me about a problem where it says you have a proton that's like a 8.9 MeV proton or something like that. If it's 8.9 MeV, the rest mass of a proton is 938-ish mega electron volts. So it certainly can't be the total energy if it's, you know, less than 1% of the total rest energy. So it has to be the kinetic energy. And if that kinetic energy is less than, you know, 1% of the total energy, you can treat it as non-relativistic. So, you know, you need to be able to make those judgments. You might be asked a question about how you make those judgments. I say might. I didn't say you're going to be asked that question. So, you know. Next chapter. The particle nature of light. For the last test, we studied light and the wave nature of light. And so the wave nature of light things, we have polarization, interference, diffraction. You know you can look at these slides right now. Yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> and then after class, I'll save them so you can see my scribblings on them as well. Just, I want people to know that I'm trying to do things to help them. <clears throat> so we had wave nature things like polarization. Polarization was something that can only occur with a transverse wave because you're selecting a certain orientation for the transverse wave, right? That's not a particle behavior at all. So polarization has to be wave nature. Interference, that's light that comes together, you know, so like basically two beams of light that meet together, and then the light adds up to give you places with no light and other places with more light. That can't happen with BBs. You can't have two BBs hit the same place and add up to zero. So that has to be wave nature. Diffraction is like bending around an obstruction. Once again, that's not going to happen with BBs. Either the BBs hit the, the obstruction and bounce off, or they don't, and they just go straight. So the diffraction, bending around objects, is a wave nature behavior. Particle nature, this one here we haven't talked about yet at all. It, it comes up in chapter 31 or 32. So the, the three above are the ones that we've talked about. The photoelectric effect. That's what Einstein proposed as an experiment to show that light had to have a particle behavior. It had to be acting as a packet of energy. And you did the experiment on that. Compton, actually, I should have gone next to x-rays. X-rays are basically the reverse of the photoelectric effect. You have, for x-rays, a particle hits a surface and a photon comes out and you can calculate what the maximum energy of the photon is based on the particle's energy. But it once again is using the packet of energy idea to quantize energy. And so it's a particle behavior. And then Compton scattering, we had conservation of energy and momentum between, for a collision between a photon and an electron. Because you had a shift in wavelength or a shift in frequency because it was in the same medium, that could never happen with a wave. To shift the frequency in the same medium, it's going to have to be a particle. So these ones in particle nature simply can't be explained by the wave nature. And conversely, the thing in the wave nature column can't be explained by the particle nature. And so we have the principle of complementarity. And when I was looking for correspondence principle, all I could think of was complementarity. Um, complementarity means that we have these two different theories that don't agree, but we have to use both of them to explain how light works. So you need to make sure you understand the ins and outs of the photoelectric effect, Compton scattering, x-rays, be able to do problems with them, and explain the process. You know, explain, you know, why did Compton find the scattering bizarre? Why didn't he say, oh, that makes sense? You know, how did he solve it? 
you know, make sure you can answer those kind of questions. And finally, chapter 30, quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is a natural evolution from the wave particle duality. Louis de Broglie said, if you could have a, a wavelength for life or a particle nature for life, then we should be able to take other things that we normally think of as particles, like electrons, or I use the example, Jerry, and we should be able to treat them as waves. And so he came up with his equation for the de Broglie wavelength, which was just Planck's constant divided by momentum. So that should be the wavelength for any particle. And so remember in class, we calculated the wavelength for Jerry, and we found that it was enormously large. And because it's enormously large, we're never going to see any practical effect of Jerry diffracting when he goes through the, the single slit here. So he has a wave nature according to physics. It's just we can't observe it. It would be kind of cool, you know, if we could go billions of miles away and see, oh, look, Jerry's in the superposition state. Jerry's 30% here and 40% here and 30% here. That'd be kind of cool, right? But we, we can't actually observe that. So in practice, only applies to small things because that's the only place where we see the actual implications. Make sure that you can go through the progression of models from Democritus's model of the atom. That is, you just cut things in half until you get to a point where you can't cut it in half anymore. That's your atom, which means indivisible. Through the plum pudding model, J.J. Thompson's model, where he said that you have positive charge just spread out and then little raisins of electron charge. To the Bohr or the planetary model where you have the nucleus is positively charged and then you have electrons doing circular orbits around it. To the Bohr model that says, well, yeah, nucleus is positively charged, electrons doing circular orbits, but you can only have specific angular momenta. And then based on the physics we already understand, if you only have specific quantized angular momenta, so that was a quantum um, hypothesis there. Then it turned out you can only have certain energies and only certain radii and only certain angular momentum. Well, okay, that's what we started with. Only certain speeds. So the Bohr model gave us very specific numbers, which had great success and were instantly recognized as wrong. What's wrong? According to the Bohr model, well, going from the, the planetary model to the Bohr model was because electrons should just spin into the nucleus, right? So that, that's certainly not what's happening. So Bohr just said they have to have these steady state energies. But then his model says that you should have, you know, the absorption or emission just comes from electrons going from one energy state to another. And you should have, you know, just a simple progression of intensities for these absorption emission lines. And instead we see, you know, very different absorption or emission intensities. And furthermore, we have things like you put it in a magnetic field and you see the energy split and, you know, you have things that couldn't be explained by the Bohr model. So the Bohr model was scrapped for what we now have is the quantum model. And the quantum model fundamentally different from the Bohr model. Bohr model said angular momentum is quantized and angular momentum has values of one times h bar, two times h bar, three times h bar, etc. The quantum model starts with using the Schrodinger equation for treating the electron as a wave and then calculates what the, just through calculus, it calculates and comes up with four quantum numbers instead of one. And the principal quantum number gives the same energies as the Bohr quantum number did. But the Bohr quantum number was initially supposed to be numbering any momentum. Any momentum is now separated from that principal quantum number. Based on the principal quantum number, you can have anywhere from zero up to one minus n for the angular momentum, and then the total angular momentum is not an integer times h bar. It's the square root of an integer times that same integer plus one. So it's not integer multiples of h bar. But the orientation is integer multiples of h bar. Remember the m sub l's? And so there's a, it's a lot more complicated Make sure you know what each one of the quantum numbers are. Four quantum numbers necessary to describe an atom. N, L, M sub L, and M sub Z, or M sub Z, M sub S. 
know what each one's name is, what it means, what information it gives you. And of course, the relationships like if if n equals three, what values can L have? Zero, one or two, right? You need to have that in your head. You're not going to have the conditions like that on the test. Um, you will have equations like E sub n is equal to E zero Z squared over N squared, right? You'll have equations like that. You need to know how to use them. The E zero is minus 13.6 electron volts. And things like angular momentum is Right, you'll have equations like that, but you have to know how to find L and then how to find M sub L. So let us suppose, to make life easy, that L was 1. What could M sub L values be? Negative 1, 0, and 1, which means you have three different LZ amounts, three different orientations with the same total angular momentum. And then finally, the M sub S's. What values can M sub S have? Always plus or minus one half. And so the angular momentum due to, to, to the spin is calculated exactly the same equation here. And the orientation is calculated the same equation. So you have the total angular momentum for the spin is always square root of, yeah, square root of three quarters or square root of three divided by unsquared at two um, H bar. And then you have the Z orientation is going to be, and I have to think this through. Um, one half H bar. I have to think it through one half H bar minus one half H bar. It's hard calculation. Um, <clears throat> so make sure you know how those work and you understand why we have the poly exclusion principle and why we have Hoon's rule. So let's just go through those really quickly. Start with Hoon's rule. Hoon's rule is the rule that says that when you put the electrons into, let's say, a p orbital, what does it mean if it's a p orbital? L equals, L equals one, right? S p d f g h j k. <clears throat> Those are simply going in order. L equals zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So if it's a, a p orbital, that's L equals one. And if you're putting the first electron into the p orbital. We just put it spin up. How's the second electron into a P orbital go? It's going to be spin up as well. So you have going into M sub L equals minus 1, 0, and 1. And so the first one goes into one of those, second one goes into a different M sub L, so it's the same spin, so it's a line. Why does it go the same spin, a line? <coughs> lower potential energy. That's the key. That's the whole reason behind Hoon's rule, lower potential energy. Poly exclusion principle. You can't have two electrons in an atom with the same set of quantum numbers. Why? It's something I told you. It's not something we worked out the math for. The wave function collapses to zero if you have two, uh, two indistinguishable fermions in, with the same quantum numbers. Now, if they're bosons, it doesn't. So bosons, you don't have the Pauli exclusion principle, but fermions, you do. Photons are an example of a boson. Photons can all be in the same energy state. But electrons, each one has to have a different set of quantum numbers. Okay, so those are the, the broad topics that will be on the test tomorrow. Any questions before I go on to lecturing new material? Mac. Well, what about relativistic velocities? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. I did. I not say it. I had it written here. Um, okay, maybe I didn't. I, I meant to write it right in here, and apparently I forgot to write it. Yes, it, it will be. It's always embarrassing when I didn't write down what I thought I wrote down. Aaron. Um, what kind of diagrams or figures could be drawn for like chapter 30 stuff. Is that like mostly Bohr's model or? Um, yeah, you could have figures of atomic models, right? Different models have different things. 
you can have figures for the energy states. You can have figures for the filling. Um, we didn't do um, molecular bonds, so you're not going to show the bonding of you know, molecules. And I probably won't ask you to draw like a P orbital or an S orbital. I know I spent time in class on that. But it was mostly for you to see that these numbers correspond to different probabilities of where you're going to find things. So you need to be able to understand that, but I'm not going to ask you to draw the, you know, the 2s, you know, orbital or something like that. You asked to draw a wave function and then square it. Um, <clears throat> for your class, the 252, um, you you might have things like that, and you might have particle in the box type things. But for the 152, no. Uh, they they could be asked to do, you know, some calculation based, you know, probability from a wave function, but not. Are there any practice um, Compton scattering problems on the review? I don't know. Like I said, the the homework base has no Compton scattering problems, so I couldn't put any. Um, I don't remember if I does our textbook have Compton Compton scattering. I don't remember seeing. Um. I'll, I'll look for some that I can give you just in case. I know it's a little late now, but I'll look for some. Any other questions? Okay, back to atoms. Back to radioactivity in the atoms. So atoms are composed of, and I know, this is going to stretch you, a nucleus with protons and neutrons. When we talk about radioactivity, we're talking about things that are occurring in the neutrons. So we're not looking at the electron cloud anymore. When we talk about electrons, we're not talking about electrons in the electron cloud, which begs the question of what electrons we're talking about, because how many electrons do we have in the nucleus? None, right? It's just protons and neutrons. Protons have a positive charge. Neutrons have zero charge. What does the charge mean? No, I, I'm looking more fundamental than that. What does it mean for anything to have a charge? A, an electric charge. It means that it interacts via the electric force. We have charges for our forces. So we have the electric charge. The neutron has zero electric charge, which means it does not interact with electric force. It's a key aspect. Protons have a positive electric charge. They do interact with electric force. We also have magnetic, or not magnetic, I went to go with gravitational force. What's the charge for gravitational force? Mass. So things with mass are gonna interact via the gravitational force. Magnetism, electricity and magnetism are tightly aligned, but we see that with nuclear physics, we have a magnetic moment, AKA the spin, and things that have a magnetic moment are going to interact via magnetic force. So the neutron does have a magnetic moment. It does have a spin. So it's going to be affected by magnet, but not by charge. Well, it turns out that the protons and neutrons have other charges. We have two more forces that were identified. We'll see Enrico Fermi's name come up with one of these. The two additional forces are called the strong and weak nuclear forces. The strong and weak nuclear forces are forces that <clears throat> occur between things that are, well, things that are made of quarks. We have the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. And so we have charges for those, things like up charge, down charge. Um, we have baryon numbers. Um, the baryon number is a measurement of the total um, number of quarks really you have a quark is plus a third an anti-quark is minus a third so these have additional charges that will deal with additional forces and here's something really unique the force between proton and neutron is attractive so protons are attracted to protons protons are attracted to neutrons neutrons are attracted to neutrons due to these additional forces so that's what holds the nucleus together is these additional forces. Because, of course, if it was just electricity, the protons would be pushing away. away. The nucleus wouldn't stay together. 
The neutrons, yeah, they would have a very, very, very weak gravitational force pulling together. Very weak. Wouldn't do much unless you have something large like, let's say, a neutron star. But we have the additional forces. Here is a diagram that's roughly on the graph in the back of the table as well that shows the isotopes that occur, the different isotopes or just different nuclei. Um, if you have two isotopes of the same element, that means they have the same number of protons, different number of neutrons. But we just call this, yeah, here it says nuclei to be clear. So the stable nuclei are shown with whatever color is inside my blue piece there. So we want to give it a name. Tan. Okay. So with stable, we have or the stable ones are shown in tan, and then the unstable ones are shown. I'm going to go with red. I thought I had made this picture so it was complete, but it's obviously not. So on this axis you have the number of neutrons. On this axis you have the number of protons. And so that straight line there, the dashed line, is what you would get if you had the same number of protons as you have neutrons. And what you see is down at the low end, things like oxygen, it has the same number of protons as neutrons for its you know, stable configuration of oxygen 16. Carbon 12, same number of protons as neutrons, nitrogen 14. Right? The ones we normally think of as the, the dominant isotopes there have the same number of protons and neutrons. But if you go to larger nuclei, ones with more numbers of protons, the number of neutrons increases. So you get out to something like uranium. Uranium has 92 protons, and it has 238 minus 92, would you believe? What is that? 140. Um, so 23 minus 9. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. 146 neutrons. It's a lot more neutrons than protons. Why? Right? We're scientists. We always ask that question, why? I don't think I have the answer there, do I? Don't think so. Why do you suppose you have more neutrons than protons when you get to a large nucleus? Okay, the proton force, that is the electric force, is trying to push things apart. And then you have the nuclear forces are trying to hold them together. But the nuclear forces are short-range forces. So think about you with your neighbors. The, the nuclear force that's holding you together would only affect the person sitting next to you. So, for instance, if I'm looking at Katie, Katie has Isaac that's you know, she's being bound to on one side and hand she's being bound to on the other. But she has no force at all with Aaron due to the nuclear force. Aaron's too far away, it's negligible. But the electric force is a much longer range force. It acts over longer range. So for instance, we can have a force that's holding Isaac and, um, let, let's say that all of them are positively charged. And there's a force that's pulling Isaac to Aaron and pulling Isaac to Katie. But you know, you don't, those, those are the only repul or attractive forces on those two. But if we look at repulsive forces, Aaron's being repelled by all three of them. And so net repulsion is going to be bigger if you have enough repulsion and not enough attractive things. So what happens with the large nucleus is you stick extra neutrons in there to separate the positive charges, make the force a little weaker, and put more attraction in to get more near neighbors. And so to find a stable configuration where it doesn't break apart, you just have to start adding more and more neutrons. Now, it's not just that simple. So enter Maria Geppert Meyer. Whoops, we have to answer this question. Then we'll enter Maria Geppert Meyer. Why does an atom like uranium have far more neutrons than protons? Obviously, I just finished saying this.
Okay. Get in there, Jerry. Hmm? Yeah. All right. We had Okay. Carrie, what I just finished saying. Hey. Why? <laughs> it is what I said. Why 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 do we need more neutrons to counter the electrostatic repulsion? Okay, what the, the key difference between the two forces, right? The protons are going to be a repulsive electric force. Any proton or neutron is going to be attracted, but it's the range. The neutron force, well, the neutron force, the force that is attracted between protons and or neutrons is a short range force. And so by putting in more neutrons, we can spread out the repulsive things, giving us a weaker repulsion and increase the attractive things. Okay, now Maria Guppert-Meyer. Maria Guppert-Meyer, this is where I become, you know, social justice warrior in class. She was a physicist, but so was her husband. And because her husband was a physicist, they had anti-nepotism rules. Now, these days, you probably have heard of anti-nepotism rules, right? What context do you hear about? The president. Because the president has his family members working in the White House, and there's questions about is that following anti-nepotism rules of you can't hire family, or is it not? Well, back in the day, they had at the university anti-nepotism rules that said that if one of the spouses is a full-time employee, the other one can't be. And of course, how did that get enacted? Pretty much universally. The male got full salary in the field. Female did. So it, it's it's not purely a, a a misogynistic one because it applied to families, and one of them would get full pay. And if you were a female and you were you know married to somebody working there, you'd get full pay. But it wasn't until the very end of her career that she ever got full pay. But she did ground bait breaking research. One of the things that she hypothesized was that the nucleus must have some kind of structure similar to what we see in the structure of the electrons, where we have the quantum numbers, the principal quantum number, and so on. And so you must have shells, energy shells, just like we have energy shells in the periodic table. And so you have these shells would apply to protons and to neutrons and to the sum of protons and neutrons. And so we know that with electrons, for our first shell, how many electrons can we put in? Two. And there's extra stability if you have a completed shell. And so she hypothesized that two protons would be a complete shell, two neutrons would be a complete shell. And so if you have an atom that has two protons and two neutrons, that should be super, super stable, right? Because you have complete shell protons and complete shell neutrons. And that's, of course, what the helium nucleus is. And then you go up and you have other what we call magic numbers, numbers that must be complete shells because they're more stable. And even numbers are more stable than odd numbers. There's a lot of, of things, of observations about patterns that she put into this. And so she published this. But this was published during the time of the Cold War, the time when the U.S. and Russia were getting all antsy with each other. And the Russians get this paper, and they read it and interpret it. Actually, I think it was Cold War. It might have been World War II-ish time. But they interpret it, and they see the shell model, and their English to Russian interpreters say, ah, it's like a grenade. And so they translated everything as the grenade model. And so the Russian scientists were reading this and saying, okay, so it's something about they explode, and they're trying to make sense of it, and they couldn't. And so we actually had a disparity in the advancing of the research simply based on poor translation because of the times they were living in. 
Um, so she shared a Nobel Prize in 1963 for her work in this. Now, obviously, this is not a social class, but even in our own church, when I was a child, there was a lawsuit against the Seventh-day Adventist Church by Mary Kay, I can't remember her last name. She wrote lots of books. Um, she worked for the uh, Pacific Press, and because of the church's anti-nepotism rule, she didn't get paid as much as you know a man would have. Well, I, I think it was anti-nepotism again. If she had been not married to a man who worked for the church, she would have gotten paid more. And she sued the church and won that that was not illegal, that that was discrimination. And I'm, I'm glad they did, not only because my wife works here at Union College as well, uh, because I was glad before you know, we got married. Because you know, I think we should all get paid what we're worth. And the idea that the church was running on was, we're all missionaries working for the church. You only need X amount of money. And so that, that was the justification. Enough on the social justice. That will not be showing up on any tests. Um, Maria Gephardt Meyer might a little bit, certainly not set the absolute church and Mary Kay. Radioactive decay. So radioactive decay is something going from a less stable nucleus to a more stable nucleus. Remember, everything today is about nuclei. And so here I have the decay sequence for uranium-238. Uranium-238 has a very long half-life. There are two naturally occurring isotopes, uranium-238 and 235. Uranium-235, though, has a much shorter half-life. And thus, with a much shorter half-life, how much remains? Yeah, virtually none. So the uranium-235 is a very, very tiny component of naturally occurring uranium. Just like with your lab experiment, there were two decay series available for the indium-116, but one of them was just a couple seconds. So by the time I got the samples in here, it would have all been decayed if it was going to go by that route. So if you look at this uranium decay sequence, you see that uranium-235 decays into thorium-234. Was it giving off an alpha decay? Alphas are helium nuclei. Based on what we learned from Maria Gephardt Meyer, what would be significant about the helium nuclei? Yeah, it's stable. It's a really stable chunk that can come out of that nucleus. So you go from uranium-238 to thorium-234. But then what is the, notice the half-life here? Four and a half billion years. Very long time. What happens to thorium-234? It gives off a beta decay that has a half-life of only 24 days. How much thorium-234 do you expect to find in naturally occurring uranium rock? Essentially none because it takes a very long time in perspective for the thorium or for the uranium to decay into thorium, but then thorium almost instantly moves on. That beta decay, what is a beta particle? It's an electron. So how many electrons do we start with in the nucleus? None. It's only protons and neutrons. So where's that electron come from? It comes from a neutron. Now, here is a mistake that I made based on my own intelligence when I was in high school. I said, well, look at this. The neutron's mass is slightly bigger than the proton's mass. And the neutron's charge is the same as the charge of a proton plus the charge of an electron. So in my mind, I said, well, this is really easy. <laughs> a proton and an electron bound together is equal to a neutron. It made sense to my high school mind, but it's absolutely untrue. So what is going on then? Well, as we understand things now, a proton is made up of three quarks. It's an up, up, down. So it's not a fundamental particle. It's not elementary. You can break into smaller pieces. And a neutron is likewise not elementary. It's an up, down, down. And so to go from a neutron to a proton, what had to happen? 
I had to have a down convert to an up. Now the downs can't just magically convert to an ups. You have to have an interaction that's going to have a down meets an anti-down. Antimatter is just like normal matter, except it has opposite charge. There's a couple other opposites to it, but basically opposite charge. And when it meets, it can completely annihilate and turn all of its mass into energy. The most commonly talked about antiparticle is the anti-electron, so commonly named that we or commonly used that we give it a name, the positron. A positron is an anti-electron. Exactly the same mass as an electron, exactly the same, um, you know, any momentum options and spin and whatnot. But it's positive charge, and if an electron and a positron meet, well, they can actually bond together and go like this. But if they actually meet, they will convert all of their mass into energy. And they'll create photons. So you have the same thing if I have an anti-down meet the down, they can annihilate and release a lot of energy. And then from that energy, they could create a pair. Remember I had pair production I talked about in the review. Create a pair, and if it creates an up and an anti-up, then that up can make it into a proton. So that's what's actually going on. And we have Feynman diagrams where you have U, U, D, and... And then you have, you know, the anti-up comes along and goes. And those disappear and make, you know, it, it, I didn't come prepared to draw a Feynman diagram of this process. But what's the key? It's not an electron that was in the nucleus in any way, shape, or form. It was an electron that was created in the process of annihilating a down, creating an up. So that's what's going on with that beta decay. It's, it's suddenly a lot more complicated when you realize there's no electron in there to, you know, to break free. And then it goes through another beta decay to become uranium-234. Now I said uranium comes in two common flavors, 235 and 238. And here I have 234. Why didn't I put 234 in my commons? You have the information on the screen. Short half-life. Now, 250,000 years, that's not short, but compared to four and a half billion years it is. And so there's virtually none of that. And then it keeps going. Each one of these decays occurs because it's moving to a more stable nucleus. If it's moving to a more stable nucleus, that means it's giving off energy. So each one of these processes is giving off energy. Hence, we can see that there is a source of energy for us to harness because each one of these is converting mass into energy as it goes along the way. So now let's get to Enrico Fermi. Watch, we'll have another clicker question and then Enrico Fermi. Well, no, first we have the picture of the alpha decay, then Enrico Fermi. Alpha decay has the parent is whatever you start with. The daughter is what you end with and then you have the alpha here we have a picture of Enrico Fermi, the godfather of nuclear power. Right? We had the mother of all bombs last week. Here we have the godfather of nuclear power and bombs. So Enrico Fermi, he worked up at University of Chicago, and he was working on nuclear physics. He's the person who described or who identified the weak nuclear force, one of the two forces that works between the things inside the nucleus. And you can tell he's important because we have things like fermions. Give me an example of a fermion. Electron. Okay, the electron. Could have all said proton, could have said neutron. They're all fermions. He is the one who they're named after because he's the one who did the math on their wave functions and their statistics. He also has, well, the Fermi lab is named after him, clearly. He is the person who made the first nuclear pile, the first essentially nuclear reactor 
He made it up there in a racquetball court, or was below the racquetball courts at the University of um, Illinois, or not, University of Chicago. Um, the Fermi is used as a distance, a femtometer. Femto means 10 to the minus 15. 15. So femtometer is 10 to the minus 15 meters. It's also called a Fermi, and those FM for femtometer or FM for Fermi. It works because the size of the nucleus is on the order of a Fermi. So he has a unit named after him. It didn't have to be named after him. Femtometer would have worked fine, but it was an honor. And there is an element fermium named after him. Obviously, he was important. He got a Nobel Prize for that, which means a lot of money. But I want to focus on that chain reaction. We'll end today by talking about nuclear power. So nuclear power. We have two kinds of nuclear power, fission and fusion. Fission occurs by breaking big things into smaller things. Fusion occurs by taking small things and combining them together to make something bigger. Now, you might think, how can it work both ways? It works both ways because the most stable nuclei are there between iron and nickel. Those are the most stable nuclei. That means you have the smallest mass per nucleon in iron and nickel. Anything else has more mass per nucleon, which means it has more rest energy per nucleon than those do. So if you have things smaller than iron, you can release energy by making them smash together and stick together. So if we take something like a hydrogen atom, hydrogen atoms, have, they're not bonded to anything, right, in the nucleus. So they have the maximum amount of mass you can have for a proton. Well, if you make four hydrogens somehow combined with a couple of phases of K involved to form a helium nucleus. Now you have the stable two protons and the stable two neutrons. That stable means that it actually gave up a fair amount of energy falling into a lower potential energy state, releasing the additional mass as energy. And so you release a huge amount of energy by combining those four protons to make helium. So that's fusion. That's what's occurring in the sun which I'll that by lecture about just before this class. The other side of the coin is fission. If you take something that's a really large nucleus, you can break it into smaller pieces that are more stable. And so that's what Enrico Fermi worked on. So I got these pictures from the same website. Um, <laughs> this one here has attribution. And so I left the other one, but I realized that's attribution because it wasn't made by the people who made that website. Oh, well. Here's a typical a typical nuclear fission reaction. You start with uranium-235. You might want to stop me right there. Because what did I say about uranium-238 versus uranium-235? Yeah, 235 is super rare. And here I'm starting with uranium-235. It's a fact. If you're going to make a nuclear bomb with uranium, you're probably going to use uranium-235 which means that you have to find a way to take the naturally occurring uranium and separate out the 99% separate out the or so that's uranium-238 from the uranium-235. And so I worked up there at Pacific, um, well, Battelle Pacific Northwest Laboratories, where they did that, where they had centrifuges and they would take uranium and they would create a uranium sulfide um, compound that was kind of liquid, a slurry, and then they would centrifuge it and uranium-238, because it has three more neutrons, would be on the outside after the centrifuge. Uranium-235 on the inside, so then they scrape the inside, and that's enriched with higher uranium-235. So uranium-235, if you hit it with the neutron, and the neutron is absorbed, so this is assuming the neutron gets absorbed, then it forms this uranium-236. You know what that little star means? It's unstable. It doesn't exist really it exists for a moment and then it breaks up and it breaks up there's multiple avenues by which it can break up it doesn't have to break up into what i've shown here but this is one of the common ways that it breaks up um, barium 141 and krypton 92 plus three neutrons now there's a key here how many neutrons did it take to start this one. How many does it end up with? 
three. So that means each reaction can go on to cause three more reactions. So if you can make this go, the reaction rate's gonna triple over the time that it takes for one reaction to occur. So if the reaction rate triples every time it takes a reaction to occur, the reaction rate's gonna be approaching infinity in no time flat. So basically you're gonna make all of your uranium 235 break up in virtually no time. When you release a large amount of energy in a very short amount of time, we call it a bomb. So how do we make this actually occur? Right, uranium doesn't naturally blow up, right? So there has to be some more things to it. If you look at the chart there that's on the left, this has the vertical axis is what we call the nuclear cross-section. <laughs> Notice the units in barns, as in the broad side of a barn. How many barns is that? And this is logarithmic, so this is 1,000 barns, 100 barns, 10 barns, 1 barn. The barns is telling us about the likelihood of the neutron being absorbed. So the bigger the cross-section, the more likely it is to be absorbed. Now, if you look at this, you'll see this here is uranium-235. If you have a slow neutron, here we have on the bottom axis the energy of the neutron. If it has a low kinetic energy, that is a slow neutron, then it has a high chance of being absorbed. If it has a high energy, it's a low chance. And the ones that are emitted are high energy. So something has to happen to slow those down. We call the low energy ones thermal because they can measure their speeds at a temperature scale. And so you have to have something that slows these down to make the reaction move forward. So I will continue with nuclear power. I'll talk about bombs and that kind of thing next class period. Oh, please 